Tonight, economic slowdown, crunching the numbers ahead of a key decision by the central bank. The potential impact on inflation and interest rates. We're finally starting to see the shaping of a soft landing. As new data shows nearly half of Canadians are living paycheck to paycheck. That used to be me until I got a second job. Facing the travel frenzy of the holiday weekend. I came here expecting to wait four hours. Long waits and high gas prices in the final stretch of summer. Plus, smashing records by riding the waves. I'm the first one in Canada to ski in that. The 80-year-old water skier breaking down barriers. CTV National News with Omar Sachedina. Reporting tonight, Vashi Capellos. Good evening. A stalled economy doesn't usually have a silver lining, but new numbers out today could keep the Bank of Canada from raising interest rates again, at least for now. The Canadian economy shrunk in the second quarter of this year by 0.2%, more than was expected. And that comes just as more data is released showing how many Canadians are struggling to make ends meet. CTV's Judy Trin reports for us from Ottawa. <laughs> This restaurant feels every swing in the economy. Increased food prices have cut into the bottom line. Now regular customers aren't so regular. People where we used to see maybe three or four times a week, we're not seeing as much because I think maybe their, uh, their mortgage rates have gone up, uh, their disposable income to come out and eat as much has gone, has gone uh, down. To fight inflation, the Bank of Canada has hiked its key interest rate 10 times since March 2022. It's now at 5%. Higher rates have slowed housing construction and home sales, but job losses are up, and so is consumer debt. A new Leger poll shows that 47% of Canadians are living paycheck to paycheck, while 36% say their household finances are in bad shape. It's kind of younger folks who are feeling more nervous, who are actually feeling a greater squeeze and who are giving their, their um, you know, self-assessment saying, hey, you know what, I'm not doing as well. So there's more younger people, younger families saying that this is impacting them. Forcing younger workers to make tough choices of where to cut to save or pushing them to find new sources of income. I got a second job, then it's better, so I'm not, you know, worried about it too much, but I'm constantly working. One day after BC's Premier sent a letter urging the central bank to stop the hikes. And while we're seeing the impact of these increasing rates. Economists are joining the call. If you're going down the wrong path, turn around, go back, do not increase those rates. Next Wednesday, the Bank of Canada will decide if it will raise or freeze rates. Its end goal is to get inflation down to 2%. But Vashi, we're not there yet. Overall costs are still going up much faster than the bank wants. Thanks, Judy. The Canada Revenue Agency has fired dozens of employees who took a pandemic benefit they weren't eligible for. 120 people have been let go. The agency had been investigating 600 suspicious cases. The CERB benefit, as it was known, paid $500 a week to people who weren't able to work because of COVID and COVID restrictions. And Rachel Aiello is with us now from Ottawa. Hi, Rachel. What exactly got these people fired? So these CRA employees were claiming CERB, a benefit meant to help out-of-work Canadians through the worst of the COVID pandemic while they were working for the Federal Revenue Agency. Now, Vashi, they're facing the consequences. They've got to pay it back. They're out of a job. And the CRA says more firings could come. They are looking at about 600 suspicious cases within the CRA. What about the wider issue uh, that has been investigated to a certain point of people who weren't eligible for CERB outside of just the CRA and ended up taking it. What's happening there? What's the latest? 
So last December, Canada's Auditor General found $4.6 billion in overpayments that went to Canadians that were not eligible. But Bashi, this was part of tens of billions of dollars more that the AG said merited probably a bit more rigorous verification before it went out. The government is trying to recoup some of that, but I think at this point they are facing billions of dollars in losses because of the government's inability to make these checks before the government rolled out these benefits to Canadians and to businesses during the thick of the COVID pandemic. Okay, thanks so much, Rachel. Really appreciate that. The federal government unveiled draft rules today for the recently passed Online News Act. Effectively setting a price, it helps internet giants like Google and Facebook will pay for Canadian journalism. Ottawa says Google would have to spend $172 million a year and Facebook $62 million to fairly compensate media companies. Meta, the owner of Facebook and Instagram, says the proposed regulations won't impact its decision to end news availability in Canada. Nearly 20,000 fire evacuees from Yellowknife finally have an answer to the question they've been asking for more than two weeks. The city announced today they can return home starting Wednesday as part of its phased re-entry plan. But crews in the air and on the ground do continue to battle flames in many other parts of the territory. And tonight, we bring you the story of an Alberta woman who led a convoy into the capital at a time when everyone was getting out of it. CTV's Nav Sangha has the details. This curious little horse is Luby. Alongside him, a black stallion named Cimarron. <laughs> These two horses aren't from central Alberta. They are new arrivals from Yellowknife. Good boys. Sienna Keller got a call in mid-August from a friend in Yellowknife. The wildfires were approaching her stable. She had 18 horses, but not enough trailers. I just knew that we had to do something about that. Keller, originally from Yellowknife, jumped into action, calling friends and family. She secured four trailers and then headed north. As she approached Northwest Territory's capital city, the damage and danger was on full display. There was a lot of smolder. And you could tell they had just put the fire out in a lot of areas. There was uh, helicopters flying over, bombers flying over. Gas stations had kilometer-long lineups of drivers desperate to fill up before fleeing the fires. Uh, you think about taking your whole life and trying to pack it up into a car and, and drive away. After more than 18 hours, they reached the stable and loaded up the horses. If you're a horse person, you know how horrible trailer loading can be. And the horses, it's like they just knew something was wrong and they got on the trailer really well. Once loaded, they headed back in a hurry. And as soon as we crossed that borderline uh, out of the territories, it was like giant sigh of relief, like, okay, we did this. They stopped in Peace River, where most of the horses were released on a ranch. Oh. Hey! But Luby and Cimarron came all the way to Innisfail with Keller, who's extremely thankful to those who came to her aid. Well, I couldn't have done it on my own. I mean, I know I'm the one getting all the phone calls about talking to people, but without them, this trip was not possible at all. Nav Sangha, CTV News, Innisfail, Alberta. Millions of Canadians are set to mark one last hurrah for summer with the final long weekend of the season officially underway. Labor Day is typically one of the busiest travel weekends of the year. And as CTV's Heather Butts tells us tonight, if you're hitting the road, pack your patience. A picturesque start to the long weekend in Halifax. I plan to explore the waterfront and also hoping to take a couple of shows at the Halifax Fringe Festival. But if you're not already at your destination, travel experts say you should expect busy airports, packed roads and long lines. There's reason to expect that Labor Day will look very similar pr to pre-pandemic, if not higher. The final stretch of summer means traffic. Take a look at this major highway heading to Ontario's popular cottage country. Police in that province say they're on high alert following a deadly Labor Day weekend last year. We had five people die during this same weekend last year. Two people died on the roads, two people died in the water, and one person died off-roading on a trail. Uh, you know, that is numbers we don't want to see repeated again this weekend. Drivers hitting the road can expect to pay more for gasoline than they did last Labor Day. The national average is $1.67 per litre. A year ago, it was one thirty-seven. A number of factors are affecting the price, including supply, taxes and a low Canadian dollar. 
Another jolt to travelers at Toronto's Pearson International this morning when airport security issued an alert saying a network outage was causing longer than usual wait times. Vancouver International Airport is expecting more than 300,000 passengers this weekend. While BC Ferries has bolstered its efforts after a summer plagued with staff shortages and mechanical issues. It's going pretty well. I came here expecting to wait four hours, so anything before that will be great. We do expect to see over uh, half a million passengers travel with us and about 200,000 vehicles. Millions of Americans will also be on the go, with reports showing domestic travel is up at least 4%. The Monday of holiday long weekends tend to be the busiest, especially at border crossings, with international students and Canadians returning home. Heather Butts, CTV News, Toronto. Two more members of the Proud Boys far-right extremist group were sentenced today for their roles in the January 6th attack at the U.S. Capitol. Ethan Nordine, a former leader of the group, was given an 18-year prison term, tying the record for the longest sentence in the January 6th attack so far. Dominic Pozzola was given a 10-year sentence. He took a police officer's riot shield and smashed a window to enable the first breach of the Capitol. Pozzola pumped his fist and shouted Trump won as he left the courtroom. But earlier, he wept and begged the judge for mercy, saying, Your Honor, I stand before you as a changed and humbled man with a heart full of regret. The body cam footage of a deadly confrontation between police officers and a pregnant woman has been made public. A warning, this video is disturbing. Get out of the car, then, then get out. Officers in Ohio approached a woman outside a grocery store after she was accused of shoplifting last month. No, then get out. Get out of the car. Get out of the car. Get out of the car. The car appears to move forward and the 21-year-old mother of two is shot through the windshield. Despite being ordered to get out of the car more than a dozen times, she refused to do so. But family of Takia Young says her killing was an unjustifiable criminal act. It's just a family tragedy because the police just wanted to shoot an unarmed black pregnant female for no reason. It was just pitiful. The officer is now on administrative leave and Ohio's Bureau of Criminal Investigation is examining the case. We have new video tonight of a dramatic mission to save lives and escape from what's being described as hell on earth. Go, 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 go. A Washington state police officer was helping evacuate people from the path of a fast moving wildfire last month. Deputy Britton Morgan's body cam recorded his frightening drive out. The only escape route engulfed in flames. I don't want to die in this. The officer tried to talk himself through the panic moments, and once he made it out of the wall of fire, he was comforting those he helped. Thank you, bro. I was so worried about you. Are you okay? The Oregon Road fire burned about 40 square kilometers of land and killed one person. Coming up tonight, Canada's widening ban on popular energy drinks. That could lead to uh, increased blood pressure, racing heart. The new health concerns prompt cuts to canned caffeine. Plus, if you get out there and uh, it's not hurting more than five out of ten, you're good to go. <laughs> An 80-year-old water skier shares the secret to his record-setting success. There's fierce competition in the world of energy drinks, with ramped up marketing often aimed at young people. Now, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency says too many products have pushed the limits too far, and it's pulling some of them off the shelves. Here's CTV's Jill Makachon. People looking for a quick jolt of canned caffeine may find fewer options on the shelves these days. An ongoing investigation by the Canadian Food Inspection Agency has resulted in the recall of more than 25 brands of energy drinks this summer, seven just this week. These products are mainly sold online and often imported from the U.S., Europe or China. Cans emblazoned with cartoon characters or pop culture icons making them appealing to children. This is a large amount of caffeine and again, if you multiply that by several drinks, it's a huge amount of caffeine. In Canada, energy drinks can legally contain up to a maximum 180 milligrams of caffeine per adult serving, the equivalent to three or four cups of coffee. 
Teenagers aged 14 to 18 are advised not to consume more than 2.5 milligrams of caffeine per kilo of body weight, making even the Canada-approved energy drinks off-limits to most young people. Kids under 14 shouldn't consume caffeine at all. The government website says the affected products are being recalled from the marketplace due to various non-compliances related to caffeine content and labeling requirements. If you have too much caffeine consumption, uh, that could lead to uh, increased uh, blood pressure, you know, racing heart, a bit of, bit of heart palpitation, severe headaches. Earlier this summer, U.S. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer called on the U.S. Food and Drug Administration to investigate prime energy drink for targeting kids. The drink contained the caffeine equivalent to about six cans of Coke or two Red Bull. Buyer and parents beware. The prime energy drink was part of a Canadian recall in July. Recalled products should be thrown out or returned to the store where they were purchased. And if you become aware of more of the now banned drinks being sold, you can report it to the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. Jill Mackishon, CTV News, Winnipeg. Just days after a terrifying crash, NASCAR driver Ryan Priest has been cleared to race this weekend. Oh, oh and around goes a couple cars. Priest upside down. He's barrel rolling through the grass. Priest's car, as you see there, went airborne, flipping many times. He was checked out at a Florida hospital, but remarkably had no injuries. I'm not stepping aside. That's that's not who I am as a par person. That's not who I am as a racer. And uh, it would take a lot for somebody to get me out of that race car. Priest will compete in the Southern 500 in South Carolina. Still ahead, remembering a tragedy. Marking a quarter century since one of Canada's worst air disasters. The billionaire businessman whose son was killed in a car crash with Princess Diana has died. Mohammed Al-Fayed was born in Egypt and went on to make his fortune in shipping and real estate. His famous properties include the Harrods department store in London and the Ritz-Carlton in Paris. The French capital is also where his son Dodi Fayed died 26 years ago with Princess Diana. Al-Fayed spent years trying to prove it was part of a conspiracy involving the royal family. He was 94. A tragic anniversary this weekend in the Maritimes. Tomorrow marks 25 years since one of the worst air disasters in Canadian history. It was September 2nd, 1998, when Swiss Air Flight 111 crashed off the coast of Nova Scotia, taking the lives of all 229 people on board. CTV Atlantic's chief anchor, Todd Battis, has more. Throngs of tourists visit Peggy's Cove to see one of Canada's most famous landmarks, to take in perfect coastal views. Few realize what lies just beyond the famous lighthouse. 25 years ago, it was mourners, largely from Europe, who descended on the rocky shoreline, there to see the final resting place of loved ones, those 229 people who died in the waters of St. Margaret's Bay. Most had never heard of the fishing village until the night of September 2nd, 1998. Swiss Air 111, Boston Center, Roger, maintain follow 230. Nearly an hour into its flight from New York to Geneva at 33,000 feet, a smell, then smoke, was noticed in the cockpit of Swiss Air Flight 111. Pilots made an urgent call to air traffic control. The plane was instructed to head towards Halifax Airport, roughly 120 kilometers away. It descended, dumping fuel over St. Margaret's Bay. Power was cut to the cabin in an effort to stop the spread of fire. At 10.24, pilot went to manual flying, then declared an emergency. The final communication. Three, three, four, five, three, the McDonnell Douglas MD-11 disappeared from radar, disintegrating on impact. The sound heard prompted locals to take to their boats, joined by crews in the air and on shore. It soon became apparent this would become a recovery effort. There was no one to save. Belongings, the remnants of so many lives were collected. Flight recorders found. 
and bits of fuselage, no bigger than the hood of a car, were removed from the seabed, pieced back together like a jigsaw puzzle. Meticulous forensic work identified victims. An investigation determined materials in the plane's construction allowed the fire to spread. Foreign families and locals grieved together, found friendship where so much was lost, and vowed to remember the loved ones taken by a horrific incident in a place of such beauty. Todd Battis, CTV News, Peggy's Cove, Nova Scotia. And on the eve of that tragic anniversary, Nova Scotia's former medical examiner is recalling the moment he got the shocking phone call. She said that there had been a plane crash, so I assumed that it was a, a small plane. As you know, it was a very large plane and a very large number of people. In the weeks and months that followed, Dr. John Butt led the team that identified the victim's remains, relying on DNA, fingerprints, and dental records, since only one of the 229 bodies was recovered intact. Russia's failed mission to the moon's South Pole last month made quite an impression. That, according to NASA, which released before and after images showing a 10-meter-wide crater left behind by the Luna 25 spacecraft when it spun out of control and crashed as it prepared to land. The mission was Moscow's first to the moon in 47 years. After the break... I'm still, you know, working on different things, and uh, uh, that's sort of what makes it fun, you know. The skilled skier setting national records and having the time of his life. We want to leave you tonight with the story of a talented athlete from Edmonton who's making waves in a sport he picked up late in life. CTV's Alberta Bureau Chief Bill Fortier now on an 80-year-old water skier who's setting records and proving that age is just a number. For Canada's top competitive water skiers, these blistering speeds, these impressive tight turns, are just a typical day on the water. But there's something that sets this athlete apart from others on the national level. I guess it's an achievement that I've lasted this long. Reg Tolliver is 80 years old. At the Canadian Water Ski Championships, he set records in the slalom event. Oh, come on, Dad. The oldest to compete at nationals and the best result in the new 80 plus division. And uh, I'm the first one in Canada to ski in that, so. Uh, my set was was a record. This is the record setting speed, okay? The feat even more impressive since Tolliver started the season with a hamstring injury that nearly sidelined him. I uh, had a good physiotherapist telling me to, you know, if you get out there and uh, it's not hurting more than 5 out of 10, you're good to go. <laughs> With moves like this, you might think Tolliver has spent his life on a ski. In fact, he didn't take up the sport until he was in his 50s. He's the only one that I've ever seen start that late in life and become as good as he is. Tolliver's coach says his student has the drive of a much younger competitor. He's very focused, he's very patient, he's very determined. According to Tolliver, there's no big secret to success. Stay in shape, listen to your coach, and never stop improving. But I'm still, you know, working on different things, and uh, uh, that's sort of what makes it fun, you know. With water ski season nearly over, Tolliver already has his sights set on next summer when he hopes to carve out a Canadian record again at 81 years old. Bill Fortier, CTV News, Edmonton. And that does it for us tonight. I'm Vashi Capellos in for Omar. Todd Vander Hayden will be here tomorrow. For all of us here at CTV National News, thank you so much for watching. It's been a pleasure to be with you all week. I hope you have a great night and an even better long weekend.